Thank you. It is so good to have you join with us again at the same time each week. And again, we do count it our privilege to be able to spend this time with you. And again, we want to thank you for the uh, wonderful letters that we have received and uh, how much they're appreciated. And and uh, people saying it's encouraged them to study their Bible. Some of these things on the uh, uh, women preachers and that, uh, they, they, they didn't even know it was in the Bible. And uh, anyway, they're, <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, they're starting to look in the Bible, and uh, that's very, very good. But we want to bring one more message on that, and I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles, if you will, over to Second Timothy, if you will, and let's go here to, or in First Timothy, I'm sorry, here, First Timothy here in chapter 2. And it comes down to, we have women putting themselves into the position of being a pastor of a church. Years ago, this was not heard of, but we find out it's saturated, as we said before, in Pentecostalism. You take the women out, and the foundation will crumble. You find out it's in the, as we have said, it's in the Evangelical Lutheran Churches of America, and, of course, it's in some other, a few other churches also. But we find out it's not a matter of uh, a woman saying, well, I feel led of God, or the Holy Spirit has directed me uh, in the direction of being a pastor. Well, we know this from the Gospel of John, that when the Holy Spirit comes, He will teach you and lead you into all truth. And we're going to find out where the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible here and excluded the women, told them they have to be the husband of one wife when He gives the qualifications for the office of a pastor. Remember this, where you find, as Peter said, I'm an elder, and uh, the elder, the pastor, and uh, the uh, bishop, bishop means, in the Greek, overseer, You'll find that also in the book of Acts. All three are synonymous for the office of a pastor. But we want to find out now, it doesn't matter what a woman says, and they all say this that I've, uh, that I've ever talked to, and, uh, well, God led me uh, to be a pastor. Well, I'm just going to tell you outright, uh, you're a liar. Uh, God never led you to be a pastor, never gave you the office of a pastor. You have inserted yourself into that uh, position because of your own self-will, it is rebellion against the Word of God. You either don't know the Word of God, and if you don't know what the Word of God says about the qualifications of a pastor in First Timothy chapter 3, then you have no business even trying to present yourself as a pastor because you don't have knowledge enough to be a pastor. And if you do know First Timothy chapter 2 and chapter 3, and I suppose that you would have taken that in college, you should have, uh, if you're going to be a pastor, then you would surely know in First Timothy chapter 2, I'd like for you to notice here in verse 11. It says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usher up authority over the man, but to be in silence. In verse 11, he tells the woman to be in silence. In verse 12, he says, Be in silence. And I do not want the woman to teach or to usher up authority over the man. Now, you can't be a pastor unless you do that. So you outright are rebellious against the Word of God. And then we come to chapter 3. Chapter 3 says this concerning the pastor now. Let's begin with verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless and the husband of one wife and vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality and have to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, or not, uh, uh, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous, but one that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, then how shall he take care of the house of God? Not a novelist, least being lifted up with pride, he fall, in, he fall into the condemnation, therefore, of the devil." Now, it's very interesting here because all of the words used for preachers in the Bible are masculine. The words elder and bishop are masculine words. If you'll note in the verses that we just read of the uh, qualifications here uh, for pastor, you'll find out the word he, masculine, is used five times. His is used three times. A man is used twice. And husband is used one time. Now, I don't know how you can fit a woman in there. But anyway, these women want to, out of their own self-will, deny the Word of God, go right over the top, ramshod right over the Word of God, and then they want to be the pastor of their church, and you'll find out they want to teach you when you've accepted her as a pastor, you have denied the Word of God, you've went against the Word of God, and she's led you to do that because you have believed her instead of believing the Bible. Now, I want to back up just a little bit 
And we have, if you've ever studied the Bible exegetically and so forth, and uh, all the way through, you'll find out that what is called a first mention principle. Wherever you find a first mention principle, you'll find where a subject or a word is mentioned the first time that will carry that wave of truth and context all the way through the Bible. Let me just give you an example, if I may. If you go in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 2, and you'll notice in verse 18, you'll find out here that the Bible says this, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. And that, of course, was Eve. A first mention principle is uh, starting out and putting the man was created first, he is the one, he was not deceived, Eve was the one deceived, and she is to be a help meet to him. She is to be a helper, she's not to be the leader. And we just want to give you a few things here as that principle carries all the way through the Bible, you see. You find out when you go back even to uh, Genesis chapter 12 where God called Abraham. He didn't call his wife. He didn't call his wife to be the leader and so forth and uh, to make the promises to. God called Abraham. He was to be the leader, not his wife. When it came down to destroying the world, we find out uh, prior to that that Noah was called to lead and to build the ark. But I don't find Mrs. Noah. He didn't call Mrs. Noah or he didn't call any other woman, <clears throat> but he called Noah. And that's the principle. Started clear back in Genesis 2:18. Adam was created first. Adam did not sin, but Adam. Or but uh, uh, we find out that Eve sinned and was in transgression, but not Adam. And he was not deceived. He was not the one that was deceived. And that principle of putting the headship with the man clear on down through time, even to today, that headship has prevailed. We find out also, if you've read anything about the Old Testament in the Old Testament tabernacle, you know there were no women priests, there were no women scribes, there were no women officials. Do you know when you come to the New Testament there, in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you find out with the twelve apostles here, they didn't call the wives of the twelve apostles here to be the leaders and to go out and uh, to take that kind of authority. And even back in the Old Testament again, we come to Ezra that was called in the book of Ezra, when uh, uh, God called him to go and uh, rebuild the temple, didn't call his wife. Nehemiah, the same thing, to go rebuild the walls. In the book of Nehemiah, didn't call his wife. He called Nehemiah to be the leader. When he called David to be king of Israel, he didn't call his wife. He called David. When he called Saul, he didn't call his wife. He called Saul. And you'll find that John the Baptist didn't call his wife. And you'll find out here the writers of the New Testament and that, all of them were men. And it's very interesting here as we go on, because we find out, for example, if you come on down, and let's go here to Second Timothy. Let's go back here to Second Timothy, and uh, we'll begin to look here. And notice here in Second Timothy in chapter 1 in verse 2 and 5. Second Timothy here in chapter 1 in verse 2 and 5. Now, it's very interesting here, because uh, back here we find out that uh, there were two wonderful women. They most assuredly were. In Second Timothy, I'd like for you to notice here in chapter 1 and verses 2 and 5. So here's where we begin to read. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, Paul writes, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. And then in verse 5, he says this. He says, When I call to remembrance with unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. So his mother and his grandmother of Timothy there, wonderful women. And what faith they must have had and the influence they had upon young Timothy as they raised him and so forth. But you know what? You don't find where any of them were ever uh, preachers or evangelists or Bible teachers. And yet there were many godly women. But we don't have any record of any woman ever being a pastor, an evangelist, or Bible teacher in the New Testament. Many of these New Testament women were as knowledgeable in God's Word as were the men. They were devout. They were spiritually minded and wonderful Christian women. Love the Lord, willing to follow, and get this now, willing to obey. A woman preacher today is rebellious against the Lord, but she will cover that up 
by trying to project how sweet and how nice, and she wouldn't raise her voice, sugar wouldn't melt in her mouth, and oh, she's just so caring and all of this and so forth. But she is a rebellious woman rebelling against the Lord. She does not fit the position. God excluded her from the position of being a pastor. And the sad thing, and I want to say this, concerning the leaders of the church that hire the women preachers. Where are you at, men, when you're supposed to stand up and know something about the Bible and you're in a position of leadership, whether you're on the pulpit committee or whether you're a deacon in the church? You're supposed to know something to lead the people. And yet, when you hire a woman uh, preacher or recommend a, a woman preacher, you're as bad as she is. You're as rebellious as what she is. And yet, you're the ones that God's trusting in order to lead in the leadership according to the Bible. According to the Bible. But you know, it's a very interesting thing. We come here, and one of the signs, as we've said many times in the last days, is notice in Second Timothy here in chapter 4 and verse 2, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth. I mean, turn away. How in the world can you be a leader in a church and, and you're supposed to follow the Bible, and you hire a woman preacher. Where are you men at? You're either so ignorant of the Bible that you don't know anything about it whatsoever, and if that's the case, then what in the world do they ever put you up as a leader for? And if you do know what the Bible says, then you're nothing but a wimp. That's all that you are. You're going to go with the flow just in order to try to get along and get somebody to marry and bury you and stick a wafer in your mouth and then feed them some liquor when it comes to the Lord's Supper. What a joke. And that's what your modernistic uh, churches do. Exactly. Especially if they have a woman. But then where are these leaders? Where are the men that God's trusted in order to lead the church according to his word? But one of the signs, as we've just read here, in the last days will be that they will not endure sound doctrine. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. In other words, you hear the truth. If you're listening to this broadcast here now, and you're a deacon in the church, and you've got a woman preacher, uh, I'll tell you what, you'll want to shut the radio off, or you'll want to shut the preacher off. Because it convicts you. You know you're wrong. And you don't really care. Your church is a social club. It's a place to come where we gather, and we all get together, and we're there, and oh, we're wonderful people, because we're going in the church, and the front doors of the church, and your leaders are corrupt. Absolutely corrupt. They're not following the Word of God. They've misled you. We find out in Luke where he says when the leaders uh, fall into a ditch, and so does everybody else, they lead. And why aren't these leaders saying, hey, we can't hire a woman preacher. The Bible prohibits it specifically. For there, she's uh, got to be the husband of one wife, and no woman can do that, you see. And, uh, but where are these men at? So when I look at a church that has women preachers, I look at the men who are supposed to be the leaders, and these are wimps. They're either wimps, they don't have enough backbone to stand up for the Word of God, and, or, the other scenario is, they don't know what the Bible says. And if they don't know what the Bible says, how in the world do people elect men that are supposed to lead you, and they lead you contrary to the Word of God? What a joke. But that's what we have today, because the women out of their own desire, out of their rebellion against the Word of God, refusing to obey the Word of God, is going to stand up behind the pulpit in a position that God never gave them, and they're going to try to teach you the Word of God. Let me ask you something. If you're listening and you have a woman preacher, or you know somebody that does, why don't you go to them and ask them, and ask them, and you need to read this for yourself, turn here to 1 Timothy chapter 3, where we've just read, and you tell me, <clears throat> if you will, you tell me if... And ask those people, what in the world, how does your woman preacher fit this description that God gives in detail they must fit in order to pastor a church? Let me read it again. All of the words referring to the pastor here are in the masculine gender. It is a true saying, if a man, not a woman, desire the office of a bishop, he, that's the plural pronoun, the masculine pronoun, he, not the plural, but the masculine, desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So anyway, God wants the bishop or the pastor to be married. And if you have a woman preacher, especially if one's not married, that's like double jeopardy. 
I mean, she is to be married, and God knows that. But not to be the pastor, but I'm just saying if she was a pastor, she have to be married. She, can't, she cannot be unmarried. And God knows that because he knows things that happen when pastors are not married. The temptation is great, and whatever. But we find out the woman no way fits the description and goes exactly contrary to what the Word of God says. And then that same woman who has rebelled against God, taken a position God never gave her, is going to stand up and preach to you. What a farce. I've never seen anything like it in my life. But it is a sign, as God said, you want teachers that are going to tickle your ears and so forth, and they're not going to upset you, and you can all gather together and have a nice little social club, and everybody thinks everybody's so wonderful because we're all in church here on Sunday morning, and you don't even have enough knowledge or backbone to realize to get you a man that God said this is what the office is for, a man, to get a man in there instead of a woman, and you absolutely go against the Word of God. And then everybody that goes to your church, you're going to teach them and lie to them to accept it because you have. So you're going to spread that lie on to everyone in the congregation that they are to accept our woman preacher. They are to acknowledge her. And then you're going to teach them also to disobey God's word because you do. The blind leads the blind and they both fall into the ditch. That's interesting. All the way down. Now, I want to uh, uh, clear back from Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Now, I'd like for you to notice here, again, in chapter 2, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Silence mentioned with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usher authority over the man, but to be in silence twice. Then he says in verse 13, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, was in transgression. You'll find in most cases, many, many cases, the woman will be much more emotional and go on her emotions instead of the Word of God than what the man will. Now, if you're married, I'm sure that you've experienced this. Uh, if you've been married any length of time. And it comes to children. Well, God made women so they, <laughs> so they can cuddle and, and uh, the children can run to mommy. And as they get older, if they want something, they know daddy will say no. So they'll wait till daddy's not around and go ask mommy. And uh, uh, she, they know they got a better chance of getting it with mommy than they do daddy. And uh, it comes to giving a spanking. Well, if <laughs> we find out that dads don't always buy the excuses that their children give, and sometimes mother and dad get in an argument on the discipline of the children because mother has too much sympathy, she'd spoil them rotten, and dad, if he had his way, he'd, he'd probably uh, spank them too much. But with the combination, if it works together, uh, we do the best we can to raise our children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But anyway, besides all of that, let me give you a couple other things. I want to go back here to the book of Romans. And as we've said, we don't find out where there were any apostles whatsoever. We don't that were uh, uh, women. And Paul, in addressing the Romans back here and uh, those at Rome, I'd like for you to notice something because it's very interesting. If you'll go to verse 3 of the 16th chapter of the book of Romans, we find out that Paul acknowledges the fact that there were uh, many great women and this isn't to belittle a woman at all. I know on our uh, uh, particular ministry here at uh, Heritage uh, Baptist Church, we have uh, on our website, which reaches out all over the world, we get questions and answers and correspondence from uh, all over. We get them from Australia, Japan, China. We get them from everywhere. And it's wonderful. We have a great outreach to that. We sell a lot of the books we've written. Uh, to people who want them on doctrinal subjects and so forth like them. They're a tremendous help to them. And it's just that. But what I'm trying to say is, if it came to me running that website and that Internet, it would flop 100%. I, uh, I probably don't even know how to turn the thing on. But my wife is. She's a genius at it. And she gets on that thing, and she can do about anything on that computer. She, she is a whiz, whiz, whiz. And she wants me to learn how to do it and learn how to do it, and I haven't learned how to do it yet. <laughs> and I probably never will. There's other things that I do when it comes to the books and the writing of books. She does all of the checking and, and checking for the proper spelling. She does the checking for the punctuation and so forth and uh, is, is absolutely a genius at those things. Do so you see, 
there wouldn't be half of the ministry here at Heritage Baptist Church if it wouldn't be for my wife and what she can do, but she's not the pastor. And she doesn't want to be the pastor because that's not her calling. And God never, you just mark this down, whenever a woman tells you that she was called of God to be a pastor, she is a liar right on the spot. She is never called to God, and that's the biggest kind of whip to use against you because she tells you that God called her, then if you don't accept it, you're going against God. And that's reverse psychology in order to make you accept the lie that she told you, or you're supposed to have a guilt feeling and say, oh, 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 he went against God, and God called me and all that. No, lady, you were never called of God, and you're lying when you say you did. Now, let's look here, because this is interesting. Here in verse 3, Paul writing to them, and in closing here in the 16th chapter, he says, Greet Priscilla, that's the wife, and Aquila, that's her husband, my helpers in Christ Jesus who have for my life laid down their necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all of the churches of the Gentiles. Isn't that something? Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. They had an assembly. The word church is an assembly. It doesn't necessarily mean a building, but it is a church can be in a building, but it also at those times back there, uh, they, uh, they met in their houses, and it was an assembly. Salute, <clears throat> my well-beloved Athanatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ, and he goes on down. Then, if we come on down here, we find out in verse uh, 6, I believe it is here, Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor upon us. Well, there's five, at least five Marys in the Bible. This is one there's nothing else said about. It's not Mary Magdalene. It's not Mary, the mother of Jesus. But a Mary, another Mary. Just like we have many Johns in this area here, we got many, many people named by the same name, you know. And uh, uh, nothing wrong with that at all. But greet Mary, and uh, she must have been a wonderful woman. Nothing ever said any of these women were ever preachers. And notice on down, if you will. It's very interesting. If you were to go to Luke chapter 10, and verse 38, 42, uh, you'll find out that Mary and Martha, and these were wonderful ladies. They were the sisters of Lazarus. And uh, wonderful ladies that served, and when the Lord came, they took him, into his, or took him into their home and so forth. And then Mary, the mother of Jesus. What a wonderful lady that Mary was. And But you never find Mary ever preached a sermon, did you? You never find that she ever went out and did evangelistic work, did you? You never find anything. She never pastored a church, did she? Not at all. We come on down, notice here, in verse 13 also. It's interesting. A lot, not a lot said about these women. But they're mentioned in the Bible because they're important. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. She must have treated him like a mother. The mother of Rufus and mine too. Not that Rufus was his brother, but the fact is that she was such a wonderful lady that he just felt like that was his mother also. She must have been a wonderful worker for the Lord. Now we go down to verse 15. Sort of interesting. We come on down, Paul says again, Salute Philologus and Julia and uh, Rias and his sister and Olympus and all the saints which are with them and his sister. Julie, perhaps the wife of Phil uh, I pronounce it here, Philologus and notice here, probably his wife and Rias and his sister. So Paul knew these ladies very well. But you'll never find where one of them was ever a pastor. Never do we find any record that they ever preached in an open assembly where there were men present. None of these. These are some of the most wonderful women that you would find. Paul dresses them. He's grateful to them. The wonderful work that they did. But again, too, let me remind you of this. Whenever a woman tells you or occupies the position of a pastor, she is out of the will of God. She's rebellious against God. She will not adhere to the teaching of the Bible, and yet she is going to stand up, whether it's for the admiration of people, whether it's to boost her own ego, whatever it is, but it is absolutely demonic because it is opposed to the Word of God, and Satan loves to get people to go against the Word of God. Therefore, he can have more power over that person than what Jesus Christ does if the woman is even saved. No one knows that. I sure don't. The Lord does, though. But notice again what he says. Let not the woman at all. Let, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usher authority over the man, but to be in silence. 
That's exactly what God said. And then in the third chapter, absolutely prohibits the woman from occupying the position of a deacon or of a pastor. Well, that's all we're going to say about that, because truthfully, uh, those that do that don't care anything about the Bible or anything like it. They'll only hate me because we re refute. I don't because I didn't write the Bible. They're going to hate me. What they really hate is God. What they really hate is Christ. And they don't want anything to interfere with the little social club that they have going on in their own little community and the heck with the Word of God. And sad to say, that's characteristic of many. So sad. But in closing, let me say this. Let them do what they want to do. But here's what the Word of God says. But the most important thing is, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Are you trusting Him? Or are you following these same churches that have their women preachers? And uh, be baptized, be baptized, be confirmed now, be confirmed now. And you can lose your salvation, you can lose your salvation and all this. God says, I loved you so much, I sent my Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to this earth. He died on the cross. He paid for your sin. And all you have to do is put your trust in Him. Trust, believe, and faith are synonymous words, for I'm accepting Jesus Christ. My faith is in Him, that He died for me, He was buried, and He rose again. And I know that I'm going to heaven, because God promised me in John 3.16 that whosoever believeth in Him would never perish, but have everlasting life. I see our time is going. We thank you so much for joining with us. We hope that you will come and visit us at uh, Heritage uh, uh, Baptist Bible Church, Walnut Grove. Our church service is from 10 to 11 Sunday morning, Sunday night from 6 to 7. Our youth group on Thursday, every Thursday from 7 to 9. And our mailing address is the Heritage Radio Bible Class, Post Office Box 573, Wanna Grove, Minnesota, and our zip code is 56180. Keep looking up, because some golden daybreak, Jesus is coming, and until then, we'll ever pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. Amen.